coming to the first question. In the 1930s and 40s, the golden period of labor union organizing unions functioned as broad social movements for the betterment of the many. Can they hope to thrive, much less to survive today, without seriously taking on the fight for the rights of the poor, immigrants, minorities, etc.? And then you'll see the second question was, uh, given the extreme fragility of Hawaii's economics and over-dependence on tourism and military spending, can private sector unions sustain their membership and power? Okay, thank you. Um, question number one, I have, uh, was interested to see that both of my questions could be answered yes and no. <laughs> so the first one is no and the second one is yes. Thank you. So... Um, each one of these are very interesting topics that I would talk about for maybe an hour and a half each. So, and being somebody who teaches at the university, talking for less than half an hour is really problematical for me. So, um, I, to do it justice, otherwise it's, you know, being, trying to oversimplify. Uh, it, when I look at the first part of the, in the 1930s and 40s, the golden period of labor union organizing, Yes and no. And then secondly, the presumption that that was because it was based on broad social movements all the time. I don't even know. I, I don't know if I can necessarily even totally agree with that, that it was always based on this. Now, why do I say that? Because one of the things, you know, my, my book, by the way, but since it's not for sale here, I can talk about it, um, is you know, I study the way media looks at labor. And one of the, uh, the things that I'm particularly concerned about is there's a monolithic uh, attitude towards labor. When we use the term labor, you know, unions, then it's like, well, that's it. The unions do this and the unions do that. And anytime you make that kind of a generalization, you're wrong because there are unions are all over the place. There are un some unions doing this and there are some unions doing that. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, uh, we, we actually have a book that, that our center did. All of our books, by the way, are online. You don't have to buy them. You can go to our website and just read them. Um, so we did a book by Bernie Stern on Rutledge Unionism. And Rutledge Unionism is sort of the Hawaii version of business unionism. And during this time period of the 30s, when art was actively organizing, he was very much um, uh, business unionism. He's the model of business unionism. And yet, he was doing a really good job of organizing. Uh, I, notwithstanding, that I have criticisms <laughs> of what happened at various points and uh, uh, things that went on, and there, certainly there was dissent within his union. But he consistently got elected over and over and over again um, uh, by his members. And, and, we'll, and for those of you who don't get that totally, what business unionism as a model is, I don't, I'm not saying I agree with this, please, I'm just telling you what it is. It's sometimes called bread and butter unionism, which means the only thing that we should be doing is negotiating a good contract. End of story. Okay, don't bring into any of our meetings resolutions that have to do with any social issues that are not related to our contract negotiations. We're going to focus on that. All right? And that was art in a nutshell. All right? uh, art spent very little time working on anything else. I have a friend of mine, John Radcliffe, who is a lobbyist of some repute, and he tells me this story about one time when he saw Art roaming the halls of the legislature because there was a bill that was important to his union, and he was lost. He did not know where anybody was. You know, it was like, what am I doing here? Um, so, because he just wasn't used to doing this. Whereas ILWU was really the other model, right? That was a socially conscious labor union, and they were heavily involved in virtually every single committee uh, on, all, on all grounds and all areas. And I have to thank, by the way, the ILWU immensely, because without them, there would never have been a, a Center for Labor Education and Research. They were very, very much responsible for clear uh, uh, being established by law. We're the only state in which the Center for Labor is established by statute. All right. uh, in every other place, it is a creature of the universities. And we have seen in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, the 50 labor centers that I used to talk about all the time, pretty much one at every major uh, state university, have been knocked off systematically uh, as a result of you know, the politics going right wing all over the place. 
And so states that we used to say were blue states and strong union states have passed right to work laws in the last few years. So um, at any rate, I'm, I'm uh, concerned, but I you know, have to say thank you to the LWU for uh, having the insight to see back in 1976 when, when our center got established that that had to be done by law because the University of Hawaii had no intention of having a labor center. Zero. All right. And we just recently had an attack on our statute to take away our revolving fund. And, and uh, I am going to be in another couple of years retiring. One of my other staff is retiring. And we're going to have a real fight that they you know, hire somebody so that the center can go on. Because some I, I know there are people who are just waiting for us to drop dead and so they can use this, you know, our offices and, and the money uh, for other programs, albeit they're probably good programs <laughs> that I would support, but not, you know, there should be a labor center at every major state university. And it's uh, we're fortunate that ILW, and they weren't alone, but a large number uh, in large respect, they, they were very responsible <clears throat> for, for doing that. But it's sort of also interesting that uh, Local 5 used to be one of the Rutledge unions, and that was, again, the business unionism model. So people don't stay where they always were. Local 5 changed dramatically you know, uh, in, when it changed its leadership, and is now probably the most socially conscious union in the state of Hawaii, which I think you know, should be applauded. Also, we have people from Local 5 here, and uh, certainly I applaud that. So uh, I am... Uh, periodically asked to teach uh, classes on uh, for stewards and for uh, union members and apprentices and so forth at different unions. Some of uh, the construction unions ask me regularly to do it. Uh, and I will only be invited to do this because I'll begin by telling them, okay, you have to understand, I'm going to talk about the difference between uh, an organizing model of a union and uh, uh, a business model of a union. And so I'm assuming you're asking me to talk and teach because you are ready to go for that organizing model, okay? which means that you're giving your stewards and your members a lot more uh, power. Right? And, you're, you know, and, and, and that empowerment is crucial to building the union. Right? And, so, uh, and there are some people who are totally uncomfortable with that and don't want me teaching at all, anywhere, <laughs> okay? Uh, and I do remember when uh, Neil Abercrombie, by the way, was in the uh, legislature when where our law was passed, and he, you know, whatever you feel about Neil, he was one of the people who supported our, you know, the establishment of our center. And he, he came by uh, a number of months ago and said, you know, when you were, we were first debating your bill, uh, there was a, maybe 15 unions that came by to tell us, don't do it. And he said, because... They'll be training people who will then be the people who will run against, against us in our next election. <laughs> and so what do, you, what do we want to do that for? <laughs> so fortunately, that represented a, a small enough uh, bunch and, uh, and was outweighed heavily by the unions who were supporting us so that that, that did not uh, rule the day. But this is a concern, right? Now, um, I have to say this, all right? And about the program and sort of the questions. I don't like to see questions that are too critical of labor unions. And I'll tell you why. Not that there is not a lot to criticize, but on the other hand, uh, labor needs friends a lot more than it needs critics. I really believe this. Right? And so, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm also a strong Democrat, and I have been for a long period of time. It was rough, because I voted for Obama, obviously, and he strongly, I had took the, I taken the YouTube clip out and put it on the Hawaii State AFL-CIO website, I'm their webmaster, where he says, and when I get elected, we're going to pass the, uh, you know, yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the card check bill, you know, uh, the Employee Free Choice work, uh, work Act, whatever it was called at that time period, and that didn't happen. And that was the first thing that was thrown under the bus as programs that we are not going to get. Okay? And I do understand frustration with the Affordable Care Act, but you know, in all reality, that was the best they could do. Uh, I, I want national health care insurance. I think you know, labor unions will be better off for it, and we really need to do that. And it's crazy that we don't. Okay, so here, see, I knew this was going to happen. Shut up, Hewitt. All right. So, <laughs> yeah. I get told that a lot, so don't feel bad. You know, it's something I'm used to. So, um, 
So I, I just want to say, be careful to, say, to hazard, go to unions and tell them, look, you should be doing this and you should be doing that, when they really need help. And they would be more likely to help you. That's what a coalition is all about, you know, is when, when you need help and they say, we'll help you, you know, that means kind of, to me, when, you know, you have to help them when they need help. And card check is one of those things. All right. And I went to the legislature a number of times. I actually wrote a bill for the, that was, I was invited to write by the president of the Hawaii State AFL-CIO when he was there at Thad Tomei on living wage. All right. And guess what? Every nonprofit in the state and virtually all the religious groups came in and testified against it. Because they're saying, well, we can't afford to pay our people that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm hoping that more people get on board with, because then what do you expect them to do? Come back and try that again when it can't even get the, supposedly the people who you expect to be on your side to be on your side. We don't have a meal break law in Hawaii. We're a real progressive state and there's no requirement to give any, anybody a meal break. Do you know that? And that's the number one way that they file suits against Walmart and the rest of the country is because Walmart pretty much ignores all the meal break laws. And so it gives you some leverage if you had a law like that. And when I actually wrote that bill several times and it goes nowhere because I can't get a single, even the unions who told me they thought it was a good idea and I came up afterwards, I still remember talking to one union leader who told me he was supporting it. He said, well, I went to the legislator who's in charge of the committee, and he said, what are the two bills you care about this session? Two. <laughs> Just give me the top two, because the rest, forget it. And, you know, that's, to me, divide and conquer. If you ask every union what their two top bills are, they're all going to be different ones. They're just going to be for that union. And we're letting our politicians off cheap when that's all we're going to do. We're going to buy that. Oh, we just, we just have two. I love you didn't do that in its heyday when it was getting stuff accomplished when we got a prepaid health care. And, and so we're allowing, to a certain extent, uh, the legislators to walk away. And I have to say one more thing because I can't stand suppression here. So <laughs> it's just bubbling out, all right? And, and uh, the other thing is we're, we can't be proud about the, uh, our wage and hour law. And I'll tell you why. We can't be proud. The United States uh, wage and hour law is even worse, but there's a tip credit. And nobody talks about this. Nobody at the national level talks about the fact that, oh, good, we have a you know, uh, $5 or whatever it is minimum wage, but you can pay people $2 because of a tip credit. And who does the tip credit hurt? It hurts women. It hurts mostly women. And trying to get the Women's Caucus to back repeal of the tip credit is, I've never been able to do it. You know, people walk away from this stuff like there's no tomorrow. I had, I went to a meeting with the AFL and they talked about, okay, we've got to stand up firm. We're not going to allow for a tip credit. We're going to repeal. We had 25 cents in Hawaii. Okay, and guess what? The tip credit is being expanded to get the little bit that we're getting. Okay, and even though it seems like a lot, it's going to take five, six years before any of this stuff happens. I don't consider that. You know, I mean, it's we've we've. We're bargaining our way through piece, piecemeal negotiations to get a little bit accomplished each year. Uh, so I'm as much as I love listening to uh, my my uh, predecessor, my speakers there. I have a uh, just from banging my head against the wall, a less optimistic <laughs> sense of how uh, progressive Hawaii is and has been. We have very strong right wing uh, movement in Hawaii. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hewitt. And, you know, I have to say, just with us, the full agenda that we have tonight is even more reason why we need more Labor Fest Hawaii events. And if you're interested in, yeah, and if you're interested in serving on our board, please talk to myself or Dave after uh, the event tonight, because we would like to, uh, you know, organize several days of this event. Okay, uh, next on our agenda is uh, Susan Schultz, Professor of, of English, University of Hawaii at Manoa. The question we pose to her is, what do University of Hawaii faculty students, uh, faculty, students, and workers need to do to effectively make demands on the administration and the state, and what should be included in those demands? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it occurs to me that uh, one of the most recent times I was in this room was for a staging of King Lear. And to talk about the University of Hawaii Manoa right now is kind of to be Gloucester, you know, <laughs> pulling out your eyes. <clears throat> uh, 
it's, it's, uh, I guess it's a good time to talk about the University of Manoa, considering that uh, a president uh, was let go, a new president who wasn't supposed to be president was ordained, he fired the chancellor, this is for the benefit of those of you who are not here uh, or are living in Vermont. Um, and so we are in a, a major crisis at the University of Hawaii Manoa right now. But let me say something a little more general about the university system before I talk uh, about University of Hawaii Manoa specifically. Um, I read a book not too long ago called The uh, Administrative University, I think, by someone named Benjamin Ginsburg. And in that book, he details the way in which over a couple of decades, the university system was essentially taken over by administrators. These are the very high paid people who essentially cut our funding. That's one thing they do. Um, I ask a friend of mine who's a poet and also happened to be associate provost of the University of Alabama about this book. And he just sort of went, shush, that happened uh, 10, 15 years ago and nobody noticed. Well, we at University of Hawaii Manoa are noticing uh, right now for sure. So what happened was that when the faculty and students were not looking, uh, administration took over the university system all over the Western world, in fact. And this isn't just benign administration in many places. The old form of administration was that you would start off as a professor, you would become a dean, and then you might even become president of a university, but you'd have your feet firmly rooted in teaching, research, other things that universities have traditionally done. But more recently, we have ended up across the country with administrators who are software executives, uh, the, the newish president of Purdue University was the right-wing governor of the state of Indiana, and now he's decided he's going to teach World War II history instead of somebody who has a PhD in it. And all over the country there have been presidents brought in. One of the things that they were doing about a year ago is these new presidents who were corporate were coming in and saying, who needs a university press? You can have student interns do that work. So the University of Missouri, which had a wonderful press, the new guy came in and said, no more press. And it took months and months and months of hard labor by people to get that press back. Um, so things like that are happening. Uh, something else that's been happening along the way is the effective demolition of the tenure system. Now, the tenure system is hardly perfect. It's sort of based on medieval forms, so it can hardly be perfect. But the advantage of the tenure system was that you were, uh, at some point in your career, promised a job for life, and that, at least in theory, meant that you could say what you think. Now, I, I, some people with tenure never do that, but uh, <laughs> some of us do try. So. Um, what has happened is that as people retire, for example, in my department, the other year, 10 or 12 people retired in a single year. And so we're just bleeding faculty. We're bleeding entire centuries of literature, like there goes romanticism, there goes medievalism, you know, there goes this, there goes that. Um, as those people retire, they're not replaced because we have these famous hiring freezes such as one that's in effect right now. Maybe, maybe not, who knows, because who knows in char who's in charge. Anyway, so as people retire, they're not replaced by other tenure track faculty. Instead, they're replaced by adjunct labor. I just passed the new Walmart. It's essentially the Walmartization of uh, the university system where you're sort of doing piecemeal labor. In other words, it's a part-time job that many people are making into a full-time job. So you get maybe a course here and a course there, and you try to cobble together a career in teaching. Um, the, the wages recently went up at UHM, so a uh, adjunct faculty member will get something on the order of $4,000 per course. So if you teach four courses a semester, 
that's $16,000 a semester, so that would be $32,000 for two semesters. If you throw in a few summer courses, you might make you might make nearly as much as a bus driver makes, which is not to cast aspersions on bus drivers. It's just to say that these are people with master's degrees and PhDs who are teaching our children and they are hardly making enough money to keep going. There was a horrible anecdote I saw in a um, article I read recently about uh, someone who was working at a community college who on her days off was, was selling her plasma so she could put her kids in daycare. Now that's obviously fairly dire on the dire end of the spectrum, but it is possible to have to sell your bodily fluids to keep going as an intellectual these days. If there are fewer of us with tenure, fewer, fewer of us who can speak our mind, then there are fewer of us who can say boo to uh, adjunct, the adjunct labor policies, right? If you're adjunct labor, you're working too hard to say anything, and your job depends on your getting good student evaluations, so you have to be popular, or as my students now say, and I hate this word, relatable. You have to be relatable to keep your job, um, and so, to have an entire university system with 80% adjunct labor, which is true at many institutions now, it's 80% adjunct labor means there's no one to fight back against the football team and all that that represents. The system at UHM is rotten. The Cancer Center, as we found out since the firing of Chancellor Apple, who tried to fire their head, he tried to fire him twice after he got 25 grievances in five years, and somehow, like the wily e. Coyote, this guy could not be fired. Um, so there are there's rottenness at the core of the university. Who pays for such things as the cancer center with reduced funding federally is uh, student tuition. Um, anyway, so the question of what what can we demand aside from please stop is a very vexing one because a lot of what we can demand is not covered by our union contract, which is mostly about salary for tenure line employees. It covers adjuncts a little bit, but not much. But it does not cover things like massive corruption, like spending hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to figure out who persuaded us that Stevie Wonder, a blind man from Los Angeles, wanted to help our athletic uh, program with a concert, and on and on and on. These are not covered by the contract with UPA. So what is happening now that I find very interesting is that the faculty are finally fighting back. So this is a flyer I took off a wall today faculty voting to censure President Lassner for firing Chancellor Apple, wear red to reinstate Apple, good symbolism. And this actually happened. So the faculty are forming subgroups. This one is called uh, Imua Manoa, um, to take the university back, bring back the governance by the faculty, for the faculty, and hopefully once in a while to think of our students whose educations are under dire threat at this point. So I have a couple more suggestions, but that's enough for me. So I'll be happy to pass the mic along. Thank you. OK, next on our program is Jonathan Dial, who'll be responding to how, white meet, uh, how might we increase graduate student interest in labor issues. Thank you. Um, this is something that we have constantly been battling against. Our population is. Um, in a way, temporary for graduate students. I mean, typically you have five to, five to 10 years, depending on the discipline and the individual, to get through this program. And for most of this time, we're really just trying to figure out what we're doing um, and, and just start swimming. And by the time that we finally actually get to that point where we're able to stand on our own, then some of us are actually becoming engaged, involved, and concerned with these labor issues. And we start trying to, or those people, start trying to work towards this. But the problem with this is that since it's a temporary population, we have a high turnover rate. So usually the people who are leading this fight for us are our more advanced graduate students. But the whole point of this is to graduate and move on, and hopefully, if we can, find a tenure position somewhere. 
But, so because of this, it seems like it's just a constant influx of people who don't know what's necessarily good for them, what's going on that's hurting them, and what to actually do about it. So that brings me to this question then. For us, we're, the idea for us is to have a traditional and a non-traditional information campaign. So traditional in the sense that we send out flyers, we, we, go, we um, post things wherever we can, we do Facebook posts and these kind of things, which now I guess we might actually be able to consider Facebook traditional. But, um, and then in non-traditional aspects, we've actually been kicking around the idea of doing something um, reminiscent of the diggers from the 60s, which was kind of doing a bit of guerrilla theater. And so this is impromptu theater, uh, but it, it happens in everyday spaces where people aren't expecting it to happen. And we feel that this might be a really good way for us to reach people because part of the problem for us is that we're a generation who has been bombarded constantly by appeals to buy this, to do this, to, to think about this, or something like that. So what happens then is a little bit of apathy, a little bit of whitewash, people don't care, they start blocking things out, and they're, they're looking at their own situations. And so we think that the way to get people out of this then could possibly be to do something that's just gonna grab their attention, utterly. And so we're thinking that possibly this guerrilla theater route would work, and the way that I see it working in my mind is we would connect with some creatively minded actors and writers and things like that and essentially do a modern form of morality play. And so that that would be a way for us to communicate this message. Now we're, we're working on this and um, hopefully it will turn out. Um, but those are a couple of ideas, but specifically things that we would like to, uh, to get out there. First off, we would very much like to highlight the continuing poverty for graduated, uh, graduate students, MAs and PhDs. Because a lot of us, like, we, we come into this situation and we're very excited. Um, you know, we're suddenly in graduate school, we're moving along, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, we think. And, um, and so it's a prestige issue. And we're, we're not really necessarily concerned with the low funds that we're receiving and those kind of issues. So what we want to do then is actually highlight that you, that, that we are actually in jeopardy and we are a vulnerable population and, um, and to point out the problems that we could actually fight against. One way for us to do this then was it would be to compare our own situations to other universities who have unionized and who have not unionized and to be able to look at the qualities or, or, or what has actually happened, the outcomes from those situations. In that vein, we would like to um, start more partnerships and actually have a stronger dialogue with universities who have been able to let their graduate students unionize recently so we can see what fights that they had to go through um, and how they overcame those fights, assuming that they did or if they did not, and what those effects are. So that's something else that we would like to do is, is hook up with those other universities who have done this. And something else that we think that would allow us to show these problems or highlight the actual issues for the students themselves is to have a very comprehensive documentation of labor issues for graduate students. This is just something that not a lot of us think about. Um, so if we were able to do that, then this would be, I think, pertinent information that would be able to kind of motivate students to become involved and engage with this movement. Um, also, something something that I'm a little bit mixed, or I have mixed emotions about. We've talked about faculty mentoring with students. Um, we would, well, well, we have UPA, it's the UH Professional Assembly, and so our faculty is unionized. We would like to be able to coordinate with them and actually get some good mentorship. But among graduate students, there's this perception that UPA itself is actually opposed to graduate student unionization because there's gonna be a another source of competition for funds and these kind of things and for classes. Now, the validity of that situation, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm still trying to figure it out myself, but there is that perception. That's something that we're gonna have to get around. And I think maybe if we could become more uh, comfortable, I suppose, with UPA themselves, then we could figure out ways to do this. So that's something we would like to work on as well. Um, I think actually that, that pretty much sums it up for me. I don't wanna continue.
Thank you. Is uh, Professor Jim Dater, Director of Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies. Thank you for joining us. As we peer into the next uh, quarter century or so, what are the major social, economic, and political forces that will act to empower American working people and unions or continue to weaken them? Um, even though humans have been laborers for a long time, labor unions are recent inventions. They arose when cheap and abundant energy made it possible for cheap and abundant food to be produced with far less human labor than before, requiring displaced laborers to find work elsewhere. Scientific and technological developments enabled the cheap and abundant energy to combine with the labor of cheap and abundant workers to mass produce cheap and abundant goods for the very first time. So families and workers moved from farms, forests, and fisheries to cities and factories to live and work and consume. The capitalist ideology that emerged at that time encouraged workers to exploit labor to the maximum. But Karl Marx and others developed an understanding of capitalism that included a plan for workers to unite and use their combined force to counterbalance the power of capitalists. The abundant and needed laborers form unions that became powerful enough to influence governments to regulate and ameliorate wages and working conditions. Working class lives improved somewhat. Now this continued until well after the Second World War. So in many ways, in the United States, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s were a golden age of relative economic equity and security. During that time, spectacular advances were occurring in society as well as technology. The report of the Ad Hoc Committee on the Triple Revolution, signed in 1964 by a who's who of leading progressives of the time, declared that because of new weapons of mass destruction, war was obsolete as an instrument of foreign policy. That the civil rights movement showed that social justice and racial equality were within reach. And that automation and cybernation were rendering more and more jobs obsolete. Soon human labor would be unnecessary for the production and distribution of almost all goods and services. Only a small fraction of the workforce would be needed in the future. And so, figuring out how to allot the jobs required fairly and how to distribute the abundant goods produced without any human labor equitably should become the focus of economists, social scientists, and policy workers from now on the report said in 1964. Now you might have noticed those revolutions didn't happen. Americans love war more than life itself. So instead of transforming the United States into a peaceful society of abundance and leisure, capitalists and their apologizers solved the problem opportunity of cybernation by keeping surplus labor busy in an ever-growing and more deeply indebted command economy of perpetual war as welfare state, on the one hand, and by inventing consumer credit cards to bridge the widening gap between wages and living expenses, on the other hand. War and debt are fantastically effective ways to keep people disciplined and insecure while the capitalists appropriate more and more of the fake wealth for themselves. Now about the same time, an economic theory that even some Republicans initially called voodoo economics, <laughs> caught the fancy of economists, politicians, and capitalists. The formal rules of the game drastically changed from 1980 onward. The US went from being the number one creditor nation in 1980 to the number one debtor nation in 1983. Progressive income taxes were made severely regressive in order to keep governments penniless, weak, and ineffective. Airlines, banks, and other financial institutions were set free to rape and pillage to their heart's content. 
Labor unions were attacked, ridiculed, broken. Jobs were outsourced, factories were hollowed out, and workers were advised to become lawyers, investment bankers, and stockholders, uh, stockbrokers. Failing that, they could become waiters and maids and homeless. The choice was up to them. Other people, displaced by automation, were urged to become creative entrepreneurs. There'll be a Google in every garage and an Apple in every pot. This Nobel Prize winning global economic insanity has reached fever pitch. Suddenly, even some economists have expressed shock at discovering great inequality between the 1% rich and getting richer and the 99% poor and getting poorer. Something needs to be done about it, they declare. Not out of any concern for fairness or humanity, of course, but in hopes of preventing bloody revolutions. <laughs> well, what lies ahead? What is the future for us now? Now, any of you who have ever heard me talk before, and you wouldn't be here if you had, uh, know that I insist that no one can predict the future. The most anyone can do is to forecast several alternative futures. So here are two, out of many possible, briefly sketched. One assumes that automation will continue. More and more people are figuring out that a world of well-paid full employment at necessary jobs is impossible as long as automation, robotization, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and all the rest continue to be developed and utilized. The triple revolutionaries were correct in that regard. And I've not read a single credible idea about what to do about that fact, about how to achieve and maintain a future of full unemployment that is any better than was envisioned 50 years ago. Most of us still refuse to look this future in the face and embrace it. Future two points out that for automation to continue and expand, cheap and abundant energy is needed, and there is none in sight. In spite of all the hype about fracking and the U.S. becoming the new Saudi Arabia, the cheap oil of the past 150 years has been burned and is gone forever. Alternatives to it are prohibitively expensive and themselves unsustainable. This is a worldwide problem, but those of us living in energy-dependent Hawaii should be screaming hysterically about it. I don't hear any screaming. Climate change, sea level rise, severe scarcity of water and food also suggests that worrying about a society of abundance is absurd. We need to learn how to survive and thrive in a self-reliant, labor-intensive world once again this second alternative future declares. So, which future will it be? Which future do you want? Which future are you willing to strive to obtain? What other futures might be preferable? Has tonight's discussion helped us think about and answer those questions? Thank you very much. My name's Bart Dame. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a jack of all trades. Um, I used to be a troublemaker. More and more, I'm a troubleshooter. Um, I am, uh, among other things, I am the uh, co-chair of Progressive Democrats of Hawaii. Um, I will confess here, among comrades, I'm also on the State Center Committee of the Democratic Party, which apparently is a bad thing. Uh, I was, uh, first I'd like to say that there are other people who are much more qualified than myself to speak about the struggle in Hawaii for, to increase the minimum wage. I was involved, I got drawn in by friends who said, come on, you know all these clowns, uh, use your relationships and your abilities to help provide some justice for the working people of Hawaii. So um, I did get drawn in, but there are people probably here in this room who are more qualified than myself. Is Cade still here? Oh, 
Okay. Um, I was kind of hoping that Gerald Horn would talk about uh, about Hawaii, uh, the, the social conditions that gave rise to the ILWU, because I think that when we talk about how progressive Hawaii is or is not, um, we have to talk about the social movement, the people's uh, level of maturity and their resistance, uh, the kind of model they're using as to what they believe is possible, what kind of world is possible. And unfortunately, uh, the kind of class consciousness that was very strongly built uh, during the 30s, and the 40s, and the 50s by the Communist Party and the ILWU is now very weak and has been largely been replaced by a neoliberal acceptance by almost everybody, including a lot of my fellow Democrats, but not this Democrat. Um, so if we want to fight for a $15 or $20 minimum wage, we have to first build a social movement that is capable of doing that. And in the absence of having a social movement, uh, and of course when we engage in struggle, hopefully one component of our struggle is trying to help build the movement and, and, and uh, expand people's consciousness. But in broad terms, uh, what happened here the struggle for the minimum wage was essentially a lobbying effort in, in lieu of a social movement. In the absence of there being a mass movement demanding an increase in minimum wage, it fell back to do-gooder uh, lobbyists uh, and nonprofit groups which were maligned by one of the earlier speakers uh, on the minimum wage. Uh, actually, we had powerful leadership. Oh, there he is. <laughs> In building our coalition, uh, we had support from some of the some of the unions in this town. Uh, Local Five, again, I will will jump on the bandwagon saying, which I think is the most dynamic and progressive union in the state of Hawaii now. Um, we had had help from the state AFL-CIO. Um, Jason Bradshaw was working with us quite closely in this. We had help from the ILWU. Um, which other unions? We had the, the, one of the maritime unions was there. Um, there were, so we had some unions that were there. Uh, HGEA, I know, was supporting us behind the scenes. Um, we also had some nonprofit advocacy groups, particularly Heroic, were the Appleseed Center for Economic Justice. They did very valuable work. I, if you're not familiar with them, I recommend you Google Appleseed and you will see on issues now homeless, they are helping articulate the struggle against the unjust policies of the city and county. Um, and on the minimum wage, they really helped give us a very clear message of what's going on and give us the study. They were very valuable. Focused Hawaii was also very valuable. Uh, Catholic Charities, surprising for a, a pro-choice guy like me, I have to say nice things. Catholic Charities was very, very strong. So we built a coalition of these different uh, lobbyist organizations. We also, because the Democratic Party had on paper taken, as we often do, a very good platitudinous stand in favor of uh, increasing the minimum wage, we were able to leverage that. We got uh, Dante Carpenter, the chair of the party, to come down and testify repeatedly at hearings very strongly for an increase in minimum wage. Now, the year before, the, the minimum wage bill had stalled out in committee, uh, and the two sides were $9.25 is what management, represented by Donna Kim, was willing to give. And the uh, labor side was at $9.50, okay? Now, that's a reflection of the relative weakness, I think, of, of the absence of a movement. But that's where it got stalled out, and it got stalled out over the tip credit, which was also discussed earlier. I think the union was willing to give uh, 10 cents, increase from 25 cents to 35 cents. Management, represented by Donna Kim, was demanding $2. And uh, so that was, that stymied. So this time, we had this guy in the White House who said it should be $10.10. And, 10 and that created legitimacy for that number. And so we fought for $10.10. I would have liked, we got trouble from the left saying, why aren't you demanding a living wage? You know, Bra, you go out there and you build the movement that can deliver a minim, you know, enough people, we can deliver the, the living wage. But we got to build a movement. In the absence of that, we're going to use the skill set we have in order to get the best deal we have. And we're not doing this to undermine your social struggle, build your social struggle, and we'll be here to help you get it, you know, to the living wage. So we ended up getting... Uh, $10.10, 10 
There were three things that were in struggle. Um, one was the dollar amount. Uh, we got to 1010. We, the tip credit was, was uh, an issue of contention. I will disagree with how it was characterized earlier because actually uh, we were stymied on this and we came up with a creative mechanism. There's a trigger mechanism so that whatever the minimum wage is, if it's now 725, but when it goes in effect, it goes up in steps. By the time it gets to 1010, an employee has to be getting uh, $17.10, I think plus the 75 cents before the tip credit goes in. So the effect is going to be that the vast majority of tipped employees will never be, be hit with the tip credit. So it, it's much better than the national standard. It is actually leading in terms of if there's a tip credit. We wanted to get rid of the tip credit, okay? The other thing that was in contention, and we were told very early on by friends in the legislature, we cannot get this one, was we wanted to have an automatic CPI adjustment on the minimum wage. So as the cost of living went up, we didn't have to come back every few years in order to fight the battle again, uh, but it would be adjusted every year. Uh, we did not get that. There's a question whether we're going to go back and try to fight on that or whether we're going to wait for the social movement to come along uh, with McDonald's workers and, and actually through political struggle fight for a, for a higher wage. Um, and the other, the other issue, of course, was, was, I guess I discussed that, is how long or how fast it would go into effect. And we really regret that it, it's going in four years, by that time, the $10.10 will have lost much of its value. Um, and we're sorry for that. But again, the real question is, is how do we build a social movement? How do we transform people's expectations so their mindset is not dominated by neoliberal understandings that you know the capitalist mantra uh, is what dictates how they perceive what is possible? And that's a responsibility that falls on all of us. So let's push forward for a higher minimum wage, but let's build the the consciousness of the people and the organization of the people so that we can do that. That's how the Communist Party and the ILWU built social movement for social justice in the 50s. And if we're going to get anywhere near the kind of social transformation we need in Hawaii, we're going to have to build a mass political movement. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for taking a look at the posters. You know, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll put some posters out there so you guys could pick them up and read them and not, go, not walk away with them. But if you did, that's okay. You know what I mean? Because, um, <laughs> you know, if I could print much more, I would. You know? But I thought that was a pretty uh, good display of Lewa history and Hawaiian history, you know, and uh, uh, radical history from a, uh, from a revolutionary and progressive uh, perspective. Now, what Bart's saying is really true. Now, I'm from Kauai, and... Um, the struggle for the fight for the minimum wage actually went on for three years or more. And those of us on Kauai who were associated with Pride at Work and um, other movements didn't get involved in the struggle until about six months before the 1010 came into effect. But whenever we went out and talked to people, they wasn't really happy about 1010. They wanted more money. But like what he was saying was that we never have much of a movement. But I wasn't using that as, uh, as an excuse. I still went out anyway. I went to college, the, the, co the only college we got there. I went to shopping malls and stuff like that. And when we first started doing any kind of picketing and sign holding, I don't think there was anybody that was below 50 years old. You know what I mean? Holding signs out there for a minimum wage. You know? But eventually what happened was that we got some young people to come out, like my, my daughter and her kids and my nieces and nephews. They came out and they supported it. It was one of the first times they could actually relate to something because it was economic dealing with their survival. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to just pass around this thing over here, uh, some of the work that we had done on Kauai uh, dealing with the minimum wage. Uh, we showed movies and we had pickets and we did our, our uh, own leafleting and stuff like that. But I'll pass it around. You guys can take a look, okay? I'll go share that with you guys. Now, so as far as the, uh, the movement is concerned, I think Bart uh, gave a pretty good analysis of, of where it's at. For myself, I really applaud uh, the SEIU and others over the, uh, that have fought for the $15 wage, uh, you know, uh, rate. Like, for example, in Chicago, not too long ago, I believe 1,300 workers got together at a convention, you know, fighting for the minimum, uh, for the living wage of $15 an hour. And in over 150 cities, McDonald's workers, workers at Pizza Hut, and the other fast food joints, 
you know, um, got together and demonstrated, and a good thing happened. Over 400 of them got arrested, you know, so that's really good. When we see people getting arrested, we know that hell is breaking loose, you know, and things are going on. Now, what I did was that uh, I'm going to uh, segue over to um, the work that I'm doing with uh, Walmart workers. Now, did some of you guys get this thing yet? Okay, I'm going to pass them out. Just pass them out to whoever can get them. Uh, we have a website um, that was generated on Kauai uh, about Walmart workers that got fired. And um, the reason why we decided to do this uh, website was because, um, you know, we get a lot of letters to the editor in Kauai and the Garden Island. Garden Island. You know, a lot of, um, a lot of le editors, deal, a lot of letters dealing with environmentalism and other things that are going on, like cops getting paid too much and all this other stuff. Uh, but uh, there's very few letters to the editor that deal with labor, you know, with the rights of working class people. What happened was that this worker at Walmart that I've known for a number of years finally came up to me and he said, Ray, we're going to do something. So I said, you know what? We're going to write one letter to the editor and we're going to see if they're going to print them. This guy had worked at Walmart for almost 19 years and he got fired because he had combined his... Um, his toilet break, using the bathroom uh, with his regular break. Now what happened is that the reason why Walmart found out about it is because they get cameras all over the place. Yeah? So the guys would watch the guy go inside the bathroom, they watch when he came out, and then they watch him go on his regular break. So they said that he took 32 minutes, because his regular break is 15 minutes. But he was in the toilet for a while because he had some problems. You know, everybody get problems now and then. So what happened was that this worker got kicked out of his job, you know, he get four kids, and he's got bills to pay and everything else. So he finally came up to me after all these years, and he said he wanted to do something. Now, I've had some problems with some radicals who have told me, and um, some anti-consumers, why the hell you go to Walmart? I said, the reason why I go to Walmart is because I don't make jack shit like everybody else. Okay. And the other thing is that how the hell are I going to know who the hell working there? You know, because a lot of my friends and relatives, they go to Walmart, and some of them work there. You know, and so what happened, because I go Walmart, these workers want to approach me, you know, because they know of my work in the community, organizing and doing all kinds of stuff. So what happened was that two workers approached me and another customer approached me. And so we decided to put out a website. So I really like you guys to go check out that website because these are really heartfelt letters from workers. Now, when I went to my, um, my union meeting, HGA. I talk about this kind of stuff going one year and come at the other, you know, because all they're concerned about is their own selves. But the thing is, is that there are millions upon millions of workers throughout America that are, you know, getting jacked at the bottom of the pile. And, f and for the union movement and for the workers' movement to grow, we got to start organizing this section of the working class. A lot of women, women of color, a lot of uh, gay, lesbian, transgender workers. You know, um, you, in, in Hawaii, you get a lot of uh, Filipinos, a lot of, um, uh, what do you call the Polynesians, a lot of Micronesians, people at the bottom. And we got to start organizing this sector of the working class. I'm sorry, we got to unite with them. And um, sometimes I feel that the established unions is almost like the bourgeois of the working class. You know what I mean? I am. I go on pension. You know? I get free medical. I get a lot of these kind of things. But the rest of the workers, like my daughters, they don't want Jack Diddley. You know? They don't want nothing. And we got to bring unionism back to the population. Now, what I did is I put together this poster uh, about May Day, you know? And I'm really proud of it because get red all over this damn thing and black, you know, because uh, I love anarchism and I love revolution. <laughs> but the, the thing is that no more one mention in here of communism, socialism, or anarchism. It's all about workers' rights, you know. And um, the posters stay out there too. And on this poster, um, it shows these women from Bangladesh, you know. Uh, demonstrating because of the, um, the uh, what do you call it now, um, factories that they're working in collapsing or burning down because Walmart is demanding to these companies uh, that employ these workers the lowest price possible. So there's nothing that is spent on safety, you know, but the workers have had enough and they have decided 
to get this thing out into the world. So, you know, what happens is that we're all connected. You know, we get these workers making these products, you know, and then the workers bring them across the ocean. And then what happens is that the, the drivers deliver them to the stores. And then the workers, they stock it. And then we go buy them. We're all connected, the working class, you know. And what we got to do is that we got to think about this struggle being on worldwide struggle, like Mr. Horn was saying. I, I get all jazzed when I hear that kind of stuff, you know, because it is. You know, it's a worldwide struggle against capitalism, but it's got to start at home. You know, it's got to start at home. The small little things that we do to organize the workers. One more minute, okay. The small little things we do to organize the workers can lead to bigger things. Now, I'd like you guys to check out that, the website, please. If you like write something, go ahead and write something. Get an uh, email address, you know. And I got to give credit to Local 5 on this one because one of their workers will help us put this website together, you know. It's a marvelous union, people with progressive tendencies. You know, I wish my union, HGA, would have that. My, my union, the HGA, they're too confused about supporting the GMO companies. You know what I mean? Because going to bring jobs. Now, we got to get over that crap, you know, where militarism brings jobs, GMOs bring jobs, killing people brings jobs. That's not what the working class is all about. It's about social justice besides higher wages and good living con and good working condition. <laughs> Mahalo. also going to open it up for questions so if you have any questions uh, just uh, raise your hand for any of the panelists or any of the authors tonight any questions from the audience yes sir is sick leave or vacation leave mandated mandated by Hawaii law yes and no <laughs> so um, we have uh, state statutes uh, that uh, provide level, you know, certain level of benefits in that area, and they go back to the 70s with the Prepaid Health Care Act and the uh, 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 Disability Act. Okay, so there are there is some you know very moder modicum, small level of benefits, and in most cases, like the Prepaid Health Care Act is probably a good example. That one. Uh, when they passed the ERISA, you know, the uh, federal law about the Income Retirement uh, and Security Act to protect pensions generally, um, they, uh, the initial response to that in Hawaii from the employers was to vacate our statute because it violated ERISA's. Uh, because when they passed the federal ERISA, it was a promise to employers they wouldn't have to pay anything else. All right. So we... Uh, uh, we have a situation in Hawaii uh, under our prepaid health care act, for example, okay, which you know has a has a medical requirement, is that it's frozen, and you can't amend it because they did get the you know got the uh, a special clause written in that uh, restored our prepaid health care act as long as it was never changed. So there's no way you can go back in, for instance, and allow for benefits for dependents, which would be really good. Okay, or expand it to uh, in coverage in a lot of different ways. So um, uh, I I remember talking to a couple of my friends in you know who, who are in Congress, and I uh, casually mentioned as they were looking at the Affordable Care Act, the why don't they go back and straighten out this ERISA bullshit? Because it, you know states should be able to make whatever uh, law they want in terms of health care and encourage them. Uh, to do that, and they shouldn't be held to uh, this line by ERISA. So, uh, yeah, the answer to your question is we do, and I can't remember if you, I can find out for you. It's on our website, by the way. Hey, on our website, because I get questions like this all the time on labor law, and I'm, my, I just can't contain it all. So I have a website that has a summary of all the state and uh, uh, federal lab, uh, labor laws that apply to people in Hawaii. And you can click on that, and you can go right down to the section that will talk about how much uh, how much leave has to be provided, uh, and what the conditions are. 
Yeah, so it's, uh, uh, the best way to do it is to go to Google, believe it or not, and, or some search engine and just say uh, labor law in Hawaii and I'll bet you will come up first because for years actually I was doing the website for the Department of Labor and so our stuff predates theirs and almost always our st stuff comes up. But I think it's uh, clear.uhwo.hawaii.edu or it could be uhwo.clear. <laughs> but I'm sorry, you know, when it starts to get past uh, five different sections, I, I lose track of it. Um, so, but I, I, you know, I'd suggest you Google it and go there because I'm real proud of the fact that we have summaries of all those different statutes that apply to people, and it's a first uh, step uh, to look at what the basic rights are. It's usually easier to navigate than the Department of Labor, uh, and including the State Department of Labor site. So, uh, sorry. State Department of Labor, my opinion, uh, we, you know, we, uh, we have that up. We also have on that, on our site, uh, copies of the state collective bargaining law in a, in, so you can just read straight through it and not have to look at it section by section. The state has this, uh, in my opinion, crazy way of putting statutes up that every section of the statute is a different web page. So if you want to print the whole law, you have to, you know, block paste it section by section. So, but yeah. Hopefully, I'd be happy if you visited our website. A quick comment. Thank you for your defense. So often I hear these so-called friends of labor just trash the labor union. I am president of the labor union. The chair is still in the world 1998. Long evening here. And just berate us about everything we're not doing, everything. And these are the so-called friends of labor. So I appreciate your comment about, you know, not to choose attack labor for what we can't do, but support us what we, sh you know, could be doing. And I appreciate that comment a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Bill. Yes. Oh, Jeff. I, like Bill, could just talk your uh, ear off, but I, I'm just going to say that my, uh, a lot of you know me and Practically everything that we've talked about here tonight, I've been involved in it in some way or another over the years. But um, so I'll just save my breath and save uh, and give more time to somebody else. I am uh, basically my full time job is organizing the Green Party. The Democratic Party was heard from tonight, but I just want to say that anybody who's interested, and I agree with Bart, a movement has to be developed. And we have worked out a systematic plan for systematically taking on building a movement. So if you'd like to get a copy, uh, please see me. I want to really thank you uh, for all the work that you've done in educating the people of Hawaii. You've educated me a lot. A lot of the information that I use on the posters that I work on, I was trying to do something in a popular, progressive form, came from you. A bloody Monday, Hanapepe, the Hanapepe Massacre, um, what do you call that now, Harry Kamoku. These things that I've worked on because of your diligence in getting this information out. And I've seen you talk to the labor of the education on Hawaii. And you did a great job. You got those people really wrapped in. And this is what you were talking about. And you were talking about the Hanapepe Massacre. So continue to do your work. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if Bart's still in the house, is he? Um, Bart, I have a question for you. Uh, my name is Corey Rosen Lee. Uh, I'm a teacher. And you talked a lot about a social movement for the minimum wage. Uh, one of the problems that I see oftentimes is Hawaii has the greatest segregated education system in the United States. Hawaii has the highest rate of private school attendance in the nation. And if you look at it by race, uh, Filipinos and Native Hawaiians are overrepresented in our public schools and Caucasians are overrepresented in our um, private schools. So, you know, where is that passion or social movement from the Democratic Party to create a quality in our schools? Um, I guess I didn't make my view clear. Um, you can't expect the Democrats or the politicians to come up with solutions to your problems 
what you have to do is you have to come up with solutions, organize with your neighbors, make demands of the politicians, make demands of the Democrats, make demands of Jim and the Green Party, and, um, and then you'll get uh, the kind of justice that you want. But it really requires building a movement, articulating what you need, uniting with other people, and, and pushing your program. And then if a politician responds, I don't care what label he's got on his name, uh, then vote for him. But don't rely upon the politicians, rely upon your neighbors. Given all of the racism that is built into the history of capitalist colonialism, imperialism, and just simply production and how you would keep races separated to destroy class solidarity, what are some of the best uh, strategies or examples that we can look to that help to bridge and to help build uh, movements along class lines across ethnic lines? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that was a great question. There is a pretty troubled uh, relationship between uh, uh, both affiliates of the uh, NEA and the AFT in many states and Democratic governors and legislators who, though, is not, uh, not as bad in many places as uh, Republicans on the push for charter schools and to strip teachers of, uh, of tenure rights and seniority. Um, to push the standardized uh, testing and the Common Core and all the other things that teachers are in revolt about all around the country, uh, the Democrats, Andrew Cuomo, um, uh, you know, governors of, and, and mayors uh, who are Democrats throughout the country are not far behind. Rahm Emanuel in Chicago being, you know, one of the most prominent examples. I mean, very often um, the change has to start within our own local unions, and one of the most Inspiring things has been the emerging network of reform struggles within uh, big city and big state uh, teachers organizations with new leadership coming to the fore in Massachusetts and Chicago, Los Angeles, Portland, many other cities. Um, people are taking a much more aggressive stance, mobilizing members, reaching out to the public and following the model of the Chicago Teachers Union and their uh, very inspiring 2012 strike. Uh, second largest strike in the last three years. Uh, you know, this little pamphlet uh, is about a new labor notes book, How to Jumpstart Your Union, Lessons from the Chicago Teachers. Um, maybe you've gotten your copy already. I'd highly recommend it, not just for teachers, but anybody uh, looking for some ways to shake up their local union, make it a little responsive to the members, more effective as a vehicle for uh, dealing with the employer and dealing with politicians. You know, the, the leader of this union may now be running for mayor of Chicago, uh, Karen Lewis, against Rahm Emanuel. Now, that would be a contest. Anybody who's ever seen or read anything uh, uh, about Karen? And uh, again, and I think another example, if it happens, of uh, independent uh, initiatives, labor-backed, uh, taking on corporate Democrats who are no longer in many places, sadly, on the side of the workers or unions. The brother here? Or did you want Gerald to respond to that last question too? Or? Thank you for the question. And let me apologize to begin with. My jet lag is finally catching up with me. So <laughs> pardon me if my mind is not working rather quickly. But I would only make a couple of brief points. And I hope you don't see this as a cop-out, how the ILWU in particular help to bridge the racial divide, for example, and it was mostly done by trying to bring folks together on the basis of getting higher wages and better working conditions. In other words, trying to find those points of commonality. And secondly, as I was saying in my opening remarks, I think it's very important, particularly under the US flag, to be quite open uh, uh, about these issues of, of racism and white supremacy and not to dodge them, to attack them frontally and to dig deeper. And particularly for the younger people in the audience, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of rewriting the history of Hawaii, rewriting the history of this region, rewriting the history of the North American mainland. And that's really one of our handicaps now. So I'm not sure if the history has kept up with actual realities. 
but uh, I'll stop there. I got two things here. One is a comment and probably a challenge to the organizers whom I would like to congratulate and thank for this very, very uh, educational gathering we had. Thank you very much. First is I find it kind of interesting that we do have a topic, which is really good too, a topic on how graduate students might be kind of, uh, I mean, how, how their interest into labor union uh, or labor issues might be kind of raised. Um, I would like to see us addressing like college students. As a matter of fact, Local 5 has started going to even the high school students. Okay, college students, because they are more, uh, most of them, in fact, are involved, are in the workforce. So I would like to see something like this. And the second one is, uh, has something to do with the presentation of Professor Schultz. Uh, the discussion, I, I am with the Leeward Community College, so I'm with the, the community college side. And uh, most of the, the issues that you, you addressed is the Manoa side. But we do also have concerns even in the community college. Uh, we always talk about, like even in our faculty senate, about the lack of transparency, budget and all that. Okay. Um, how, how may students and even faculty kind of address this? Any suggestions to us? I think one thing that this new group, Imua Manoa, is doing is they are emailing administrators whenever something doesn't happen. For example, one of the most recent emails was the Board of Regents is about to meet again. And you may know that the Board of Regents has taken to meeting behind closed doors and not letting people know what they're talking about. Well, there, there is a, a, a rule that the Board of Regents has to announce their agenda a week in advance. So today I got this beautiful email from someone in this group that had been sent to the Board of Regents saying, it's less than a week, where's your agenda? So I think, I mean, just absolutely nipping on the heels of admin to say, you're not being transparent. We want to be there. We want shared governance like we used to have. Give, you know, if you don't give it to us, we'll take it. But it's going to take a lot of hard work by some very committed people to do that and a lot of watchdogging. I should think so because the, the absolutely the issues are very much the same. So I think the, the Manoa group is it just started because it's like, oh my God, Manoa's going down the tubes. But but really I think the more kind of groups that cross campuses and that cross also that cross um, full time faculty and part time faculty. Uh, joining together. One of the things that's really disappointed me is the way in which many full-time faculty think it's not such a bad thing that there's this crisis because then they won't have to teach the lower level courses because they'll be more adjuncts, right? And that's very disappointing because that means that they're not feeling any solidarity with people who are laboring in the same classrooms they are. So I think more rabble rousing on that score is needed too. Okay, so um, I'm, uh, William has a comment, and then uh, we're going to have one more question, and then we'll, we'll go to the book signing. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, because I uh, sadly fumbled the ball on trying to remember our URL, <laughs> I felt it was important, since this is going to be on Olelo, um, that the website for CLEAR is clear.uhwo.hawaii.edu. So, and I'm going to uh, see if I can <laughs> shamelessly <laughs> can you get that on in focus. Okay, because we have all of the state and federal labor laws that apply to people on that site, but we also have uh, a huge amount of material on Hawaii's labor history, 
We have a timeline, we have biographies, uh, and we have an e-library that has all of the books that we've published, including the one I did on the Hilo Massacre, <clears throat> and uh, as well as we have on that e-library uh, four, I think three or four of our programs of Rice and Roses, the history uh, documentaries that are streaming video that you can watch right online. So no charge, now it's all free stuff online on that website, uh, the Center for Labor Education and Research. So uh, I ask all of you to uh, uh, have bookmark this site. Okay, we have time for one more question and then we'll uh, go to the book signing. Yeah? What I have is uh, more of a response to the question earlier about how to bring in um, the junior colleges rather than a question. So um, aside from Imua Manoa, there's other groups that are actually popping up as well. The one that GSO is heavily involved in is called Fix UH Manoa. And um, we've actually had a lot of interest from other UH schools um, from the island and from other islands. And it seems like what's going to end up happening is there's going to be a, it's going to not just be Fix UH Manoa, now there's going to be Fix UH Hilo, there's going to be Fix UH West Oahu, and it's starting to pop up. And this group in particular, Fix UH, while it's heavily involved or, or uh, comprised of graduate students, we do have faculty involved as well, and we're coordinating with Amua Manoa as well. So I think that actually what you're asking about is starting to occur. We just need to be able to foster that and present it. I've been a UH Manoa faculty for 40 years, uh, and I have never, ever seen the kind of visceral outrage uh, on the campus among faculty that I see now. I mean, not only in the emails, but the, the mobilizations. It's really gratifying. People are really determined <laughs> to change the structure of the institution, to challenge the people at the top, to challenge the whole reward system. Uh, and. Um, uh, just to take a little difference with, uh, with Susan here, uh, obviously uh, with the cutbacks, uh, they're going to uh, fire or lay off a bunch of lecturers, uh, which means that we, the privileged faculty, we are privileged, uh, will be teaching more courses uh, and our uh, working additions will be changed uh, for the worse. So we're all in this together, folks, and people are beginning to realize this. But uh, Imua! We go forward. So with that, uh, we'll conclude uh, this year's Labor Fest Hawaii. And thank you again for attending.